My name is Mark Nordenberg. I'm the former chancellor of the University of Pittsburgh and currently am privileged to serve both as chair of the university's Institute of Politics and director of its Dick Thornburg Forum for Law and Public Policy. Uh, it is in those roles that I have the privilege of welcoming you to this evening's program. Uh, I also do want to gratefully acknowledge the presence of Kim Carson, the program director for the Thornburg Forum. Uh, and <laughs> Samantha Balbier, the director of the Institute of Politics and a member of the Thornburg Forum's executive committee. You don't know how many people I'm going to introduce, uh, Ginny. You, you started uh, something here that can't be broken. Uh, and Ginny Thornburg, David Thornburg, Sam Zacharias, and David Aaronworth, all of whom are members of the executive committee of the Thornburg Forum. as is David's brother John, occasionally at least, who is here with us tonight. Uh, I do also want to gratefully acknowledge the presence online uh, of State Senator Dan Laughlin, uh, who has already demonstrated an interest in this topic, and it's very nice that he could join us. Uh, a main mission of the Thornburg Forum is to build upon the legacy of Dick Thornburg uh, and what a legacy it is. Uh, in everything he did, uh, United States Attorney, Assistant U.S. Attorney General in charge of the Criminal Division, two-term Governor of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, uh, United States Attorney General under both President Reagan and President George H.W. Bush, Under Secretary General of the United Nations, and all that he did to keep himself busy when he was not in an official position. Uh, he was known for both character and competence. Uh, and recently, we've also had the opportunity to recognize the legacies of some other members of the Thornburg family. Uh, last month, in connection with the Thornburg family lecture on disability law and policy, uh, I had the chance to single out Ginny Thornburg uh, for her global reputation as an advocate for the disability community. Uh, and tonight we get to hear directly uh, from son David, who really has built an amazing career of his own uh, as a champion of good governance. Uh, at earlier points in his career, David served as director of the Wharton Small Business Development Center at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, as executive director of the Economy League of Greater Philadelphia, uh, as president and CEO of the Alliance for Regional Progress, as executive director of the Fells Institute of Government at Penn, uh, and as president and CEO of the Committee of 70. How old are you anyway, uh, David? Uh, the Committee of 70 is a uh, highly respected, uh, more than century old uh, organization focused on good government in Philadelphia and in Pennsylvania more broadly. Uh, central to its mission is strengthening democracy and protecting and improving the voter processes in Pennsylvania. Uh, and David is widely regarded as one of the state's leading experts on elections. 
uh, while serving as president and CEO of the Committee of Seventy. Uh, David got involved in another little detour, uh, serving as the founding chair of Draw the Lines, uh, an initiative that did an incredible job uh, in elevating public interest in the processes of redistricting and also exposing members of the public to the new forms of technology that could make almost anyone a mapper. Uh, as I say that, though, I look at my friend, uh, Dr. Jonathan Service, who is from the Carnegie Mellon faculty and who served as uh, redistricting consultant for the legislative uh, reapportionment commission that I chaired. And I don't mean, Jonathan, that anyone armed with technology could do a job a fraction as good uh, as the one that you did. Uh, but based on his experiences with Draw the Line, uh, David decided that uh, maybe his life would be richer uh, and maybe he would have a greater impact uh, if he gave up all of the management responsibilities that come with being CEO uh, and just focused on important topics of interest to him uh, and of importance to the Commonwealth. Uh, so he now is former president and CEO uh, and senior uh, consultant at the uh, Committee of 70 uh, with a particular focus on open primaries, uh, repealing the laws that make Pennsylvania's primaries closed uh, and in the process uh, enhancing governance in Pennsylvania. Uh, David, it's wonderful to have you here uh, to make this special contribution to the forum that bears your father's name. Welcome. Well, thank you so much, Mark. And I, I can't pass up the opportunity to uh, return the favor and thank you uh, for your service in so many ways to this community and the Commonwealth. You did bring up uh, the dirty word of redistricting. And I, I can't tell you, having uh, worked in those vineyards for a good few years, how incredibly important and vital uh, Mark's role uh, was in bringing about a set of maps that represent Pennsylvania and that in a hugely significant way have, have made a, a difference over the next 10 years uh, for the way we govern ourselves. So. We owe you a great deal, Mark. Thank you. So I was remembering uh, the last time I was here, back in October, uh, had the uh, incredible opportunity myself to join with my family in honoring uh, our dad, uh, Dick Thornburg, uh, in a forum that lasted uh, uh, the better part of an afternoon. I had the opportunity to moderate a number of sessions that reflected on his life uh, uh, and his life of service, which was um, a great honor uh, for me, uh, an enormous amount of work, and, and I know there are a bunch of folks uh, here who were there, uh, but just a, a, a beautiful celebration of, as they say, a life well lived, um, and uh, something I will always treasure. <clears throat> and if you have trouble sleeping, um, I, I did notice a, a few months ago that PCN is showing this at prime time at maybe two, three in the morning on a Sunday night. So you can kind of relive the magic uh, or live it for the first time uh, if, if you weren't able to join us. But, um, and I know John feels this way, my brother uh, Bill and, and my brother Pete, it's, it is an enormous honor <laughs> to be uh, raised by you, mom, and, and my dad, and, and to benefit from the example that you shared with us and, and the people of your community and, and this commonwealth. And I wanna use that as a way to get to our topic tonight because one of the things I think they impressed on us from an early age is that, you know, uh, as they say, as a citizen, 
and as a, an active citizen, one of your obligations and opportunities is, as they say, to when you see something, you got to say something. And not just that. It's not just when you see something amiss. When you see something that could be improved, that you see something that could be made better, you don't stop with the saying. You try to do something about it. And uh, that is a, a, a hugely important lesson that we all have to remember. And is, uh, you know, the, the beautiful thing about this country is you get to do that. You get to do that from whatever station you are in life. Uh, you can stand up and raise your hand and say, something's wrong here, uh, and it's not working as it should, and we've got to do something about it. So, as I said, that's what leads me to this, um, this topic this evening. As Mark said, I did have this kind of a, an epiphany uh, of sorts um, as I uh, uh, finished about seven years at the Committee of 70. I had a conversation with myself to say, well, what do you want to do now? And uh, I, as Mark said, I said, you know, uh, the, I love the job of being the CEO of the Committee of 70. It's a venerable and hugely important organization. But I wanted to take on one challenge that I think could make a difference uh, to the way this Commonwealth works and the way we govern ourselves. And that's what brought me uh, to this issue. And, it started with, and I expect there's a lot of folks in this room who share this concern, that um, our politics and, and the way we practice democracy is not in good shape. Um, and, you know, you could go to the word salad of words that we use to decry our situation. You can say we're in a sense, we're in a, a, a nasty, hyper-partisan, uh, toxic, uh, situation where uh, our political parties spend a lot of time talking about, yelling about what's wrong with the other party and precious little time talking about what exactly they stand for, the values they stand for, the, the policies, the objectives, the problems they're trying to solve. Uh, and it seemingly gets nastier and nastier. And now you're thinking, but why the football field? <laughs> because this is, this is my sense. This problem is particularly acute here in Pennsylvania because we have a political culture that at its best, to my mind, has always lived between the 40-yard lines of the political football field. And I would say that by reflection of some of the great leaders that we've had in this commonwealth, including my dad, but you think of um, so many others, starting with governors, a, a Governor Ridge, a, a, a Governor Casey, Governor Wolf. These are folks who, as someone said, they're from the governing class, the governing wing of their parties. They're, they got elected because they wanted to do something. And they recognized that in order to do something, you have to realize that you're not gonna get everything, that you're gonna end up having to come to the middle do a little back and forth with folks that don't share your interests and values in the interest of getting something done. As someone said to me the other day that our problem now seems to be that folks get elected uh, and, and their ratio of ambition to the need to serve is out of whack. The ambition to service ratio is too stilted, uh, too tilted towards uh, that sense of ambition. So we, we have big problems. And, you know, in the course of my epiphany, as I had this conversation with myself, the question is, well, what are you going to do about it? And I had known, because let's just say by nature, uh, I am a, a, a political independent. I'll confess that my first, actually second vote as, as president for president was for John Anderson, if any of you remember him, in 1980 who was a former Republican congressman who decided to become an independent over, over the uh, war. Um, but I've been a Republican most of my life, so we'll call myself a, a, uh, 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 an independent uh, Republican. But, uh, you know, the, the way I looked at it is, and you can come at it from several angles, but the, the, the people who are serving in Harrisburg, serving in county government, serving in Pittsburgh or Philadelphia, serving in, in Washington on behalf of Pennsylvania, they're not bad people. 
but they're responding to a set of incentives that lead them astray, that, that value a hyper-partisan gridlock over productive dialogue and, and uh, consensus building. So if we're gonna take this problem on, we gotta look at the incentives that, that get us to where we are. And here's where we find the problem that I wanna talk to you about tonight, which is ironically enough, the primary problem. We're one of only nine states that strictly prohibits, bars, bans, independent voters from voting in primary uh, elections. That's the what. The so what is, once you understand the, the pyramid of politics as to how folks get elected, you realize that in those primaries, candidates are elected by a small number of more extreme voters, and they're in responding to those, uh, uh, that electorate, they then march off to represent those folks uh, in accordance with the rights and, and wishes and values of the folks uh, that, are, uh, that have elected them. And I'll just point out here, and this is a, a fact lost on a lot of folks, that unfortunately, for a variety of different reasons, in an extraordinary number of circumstances, the primary election is the election. Look at the, look at the 2022 uh, legislative elections, House and Senate last year. I literally counted them all up. 90% of them, 90% of them, nine out of 10, were effectively decided in the primary, meaning there was no opposition in the general election or it was relatively token opposition. So if you don't vote in the primary, you don't count. And the folks who count, who do vote in the primary, that small, smaller, narrow band of, of folks who come from the more extreme wings of the parties count an awful lot. So I'm gonna suggest that's the root of our problem and it leaves, if what you're interested in is a, a productive government that, that works for the people of Pennsylvania, you can only be frustrated and exhausted. And by the way, we're talking about 1.1 million voters. That magnitude gets lost on folks when we start talking about other issues around voting. I, I defy you to come up with another issue that someone would label as voter suppression that even comes remotely close to locking 1.1 taxpaying voters out of the polls, which as someone has pointed out, well, given that we pay for, all of us pay for primary elections, it's hard to find a more clear example of taxation without representation when you get to pay for the party, but you don't get to come. Uh, it also, uh, you know, artificially lowers primary turnout. Again, this sense of a narrow band of voters who get to, uh, who get to make the call. And it, again, it encourages candidates to, to speak to those voters because it's all over in the primary uh, and uh, it makes, I guess, their life uh, easier, but, uh, but it doesn't work for the rest of us. So, stands to reason there's a fairly straightforward way, not a revolutionary way. Keep in, keep in mind what I said at the outset. 41 other states have figured out some way to allow independent voters to participate. There's 41 different ways of doing it, but we're, we're an outlier. <laughs> we're different and that's bad. Um, so if we repeal those, uh, those clo closed primaries and allow those uh, 1.1 uh, independent, 1.1 million independent voters to vote, um, then we're gonna start to push back on, on some of the problems that, that I outlined. And by the way, just to be clear, the proposal that we're after, and which actually Dan Laughlin, Mark mentioned, is uh, for which he's a champion, is a simple version of uh, repealing uh, closed primaries, which simply allows independent voters to choose the primary in which they participate. So it's not a free for all, it's not, you know, Democrats voting for Republicans or Republicans voting for Democrat, it just narrowly targets uh, those 1.1 million voters. And I, I borrow this line from Alan Novak, some of you may know Alan, he was the state chair of the Republican Party for uh, good while, remains active in politics. And he said, this is the right thing to do and it's the smart thing to do. It's smart because it changes the incentives for governing. 
in a, in a very productive way. And it's the right thing uh, because it uh, brings 1.1 million, again, taxpaying voters uh, into the process. So who are these folks? <laughs> As we began this, uh, we started to realize that nobody's really paid much attention to 1.1 million voters. Now, why is that? Because they can't vote in primaries. And, you know, the basic rule of political, political logic says when you run for office, you pay attention to the voters who are there, not the ones who used to be there or who could be there in the future. So this is kind of a, a astoundingly uh, un misunderstood or poorly understood group, so we set about uh, to change that. It's important to know this is a very fast-growing segment in uh, Pennsylvania, uh, faster than Republicans and much faster than Democrats in the last 10 years. Importantly, and, and I think for all of us interested in the future of the Commonwealth, we have to really zero in on this. Young voters. Latino voters, Asian American voters, Indian American voters, veterans are all much more likely to be independents. And you can think about why that's the case, but let me just point out that the only reason this Commonwealth is growing in population right now is because particularly uh, of Latino voters and Asian American and Indian American uh, voters of, of the population. So it, it feels, uh, somewhere between ironic and, um, uh, and uh, head spitting to say that we're embracing those folks as a source of energy and ideas and entrepreneurial activity, but on the same time saying them, we don't really want you to vote in, uh, in your local communities. This becomes clear when you look at the geographic concentration. Uh, the, the, Darker areas are the highest concentrations of independent voters, and those are the growing parts of Pennsylvania, which is not to say there aren't pockets of growth elsewhere. The one thing that doesn't show up on the map here, interestingly, is we are right in the middle of an independent voter hotspot, which is the Oakland neighborhood of, of, of Pittsburgh. And you think, well, why is that? And it says right there, young voters. So, uh, which again is another unfortunate uh, irony in that we all want young folks, high school students, college students to get involved in the democratic process, but then when they choose to follow their values or their conscience or their upbringing and not register in a party, we lock them out. And here you are. <laughs> you always want to be number one. Allegheny County has the most independent uh, voters registered of any county in the Commonwealth. So even though Philadelphia County is a little bit bigger, they're more in Allegheny County uh, than, than elsewhere. Let me stop and get behind the numbers and tell you uh, a couple of quick stories because that, this to me sort of really uh, makes human this notion that th we're doing something wrong. Uh, a couple of years ago, uh, I think it was at election of 2015, the primary election, I went to my polling place, our local library, and maybe like some of you, I um, like to get there early. You feel extra virtuous if you're in line by uh, 7.15. And there was a young woman, let's call her this young woman, in front of me with, with two young kids. Um, and I smiled at her because even though our kids are well past the age of her kids, I remember the peculiar torture involved in getting your kids out the door first thing in the morning, church, school, voting, whatever. So she already, you know, earned an extra, uh, an extra uh, check mark for, for virtue in, in, in wrangling her kids. So she's got the, you know, four-year-old uh, on the hip and the two-year-old in the stroller, and she approaches the, the, uh, the card table uh, where the, the elections board is waiting for her. And she says, brightly and cheerily, she says, um, hi, I just moved here from out of state and I'm an independent voter, so could you tell me how I vote? And this, all the blood drained out of the folks behind the table. They're like, I'm not gonna tell her. Are you gonna tell her? No, 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 no I'm not gonna tell her. And I was thinking to myself like, clearly, maybe one of her incentives to get the kids up and going was she promised them that this was gonna be a special experience they were gonna get a I voted sticker, 
And maybe mommy would even take them into the booth and show them their way around. So she gets turned away. She gets sent home, 7.20 in the morning, having gone through all that. And I can only imagine the, the conversation on the, on the way home as her kids are saying to, you, to her, Mommy, what, I thought you said you were going to vote. What, what happened? What happened? And she tries to tell them. And they can only say the, the classic line that all two-year-olds and four-years are well-versed in, which is, that's not fair, Mommy. And it's just not. It's just not. So here's story number two. And this one, I'm going to bring in some reinforcements. Uh, you may recognize this, this gentleman. If you don't, he will introduce himself. Hi, I'm Rocky Blyer. If you are old enough, you may remember me for the years I played with the Pittsburgh Steelers. You may know I'm also a veteran. I served in the United States Army during the Vietnam War, where I was seriously wounded, earning the Bronze Star and a Purple Heart. My military service also provided me the opportunity to find a platform for the rights and freedoms of the American people, the ability to speak out on both state and national issues that become important to the American people. When I served our country in Vietnam, many of the men I served with couldn't vote or legally buy beer. They hadn't yet turned 21, but they could sacrifice their lives for this country. To a lot of us, it didn't seem fair that young men drafted to fight a war for their country couldn't pick the leaders who were sending them to risk their lives in battle. The rest of the nation shared that sentiment and came to believe that if you're old enough to fight, you're old enough to vote. And in 1971, the 26th Amendment to the Constitution was ratified to lower the voting age to 18. It was ratified in four months, the fastest amendment in U.S. history. That's why I'm concerned by the fact that Pennsylvania denies independent voters the right to vote in primary elections. It's an archaic law. You see, half of all veterans identify as political independents. That veterans choose to register as independents doesn't surprise me. When you fight for our country and our freedom, you're not fighting for Republicans or Democrats. You're not on the red team or the blue team. You're on the red, white, and blue team. That's why it's particularly disappointing to know that independent voters are barred from primary elections in Pennsylvania. How would you explain to a young man or woman returning to their family in Pennsylvania from their service in Iraq or Afghanistan that they can't cast a vote in a primary election? That's un-American. Now it's time we do something similar in Pennsylvania. Join me. Visit BallotPA.org to sign the petition to let your state legislators know it's time to repeal closed primaries. Thank you. I have to say, having grown up in the glory years of the Steelers, uh, uh, meeting Rocky Blyer and enlisting him in this cause was a great thrill. And the fact that I have Rocky Blyer's cell phone on mine is just mind boggling. And I have to tell you, a uh, great credit to him. Of course, we gave him a script to read and write, and he basically tore it up and wrote it himself. So 90% of those are his, his words, and he's... Um, Offered to help as much as he can around him. We actually built a statewide veterans leadership group uh, where he is co-chair. And you may re recognize some other familiar names. Uh, Jack Wagner, the former Auditor General and uh, State Senator, uh, a great American. We One of the highlights of our efforts so far is a, a, uh, an event at the Brentwood VFW with Rocky Blyer and, and Jack Wagner, uh, which was really tremendous. We got about 75 people there um, and some news coverage, which was even better. But we're really trying to emphasize this because, as he said, that, that phrase that begins with, imagine trying to explain to a young person who has served their country and put their lives on their line that they when they come home to Pennsylvania they can't vote that is un-american and we've tried to figure out how many voters we're talking about the the quick math is there's 800,000 ish uh, veterans in Pennsylvania if half of those ballpark are uh, veterans uh, are, are independent voters as the research suggests then we're talking about 400,000 voters who are veterans that we're locking out of this process. 
And you know, I, I said to people who say, well, it, it can't possibly be 400,000. It means maybe it's 200,000 tops. The answer to the question, how many veterans are we prohibiting from voting in any election should be zero. Zero. So that to me is puts this in, in, in great focus. Um, we've also had uh, a great deal of interest from students and literally just about a month ago started a, 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 a network of students from universities. You'll note that Pitt is not yet represented here. So I see a couple of maybe likely Pitt student suspects. And if the spirit moves you, we want to you know, get the Panthers uh, on, on the board, as it were. But uh, it's incredibly, the, the, the leader of this effort is a second generation Chinese American. His parents came here uh, to uh, escape the, the uh, then what we called communist China. Uh, he lives in Montgomery County and he is an astounding citizen who just happens to be an independent voter. And he's embraced this uh, cause, and, uh, uh, but there's lots of, lots of room for others. A Couple other things about this issue. It turns out it's incredibly popular with voters of all stripes, of all the ideologies, 74% overall, ranging from 69% of self-described Trump Republicans to 85% of progressive voters, 80% of black voters. You can cut the numbers any way you want and you're gonna get that, that level of support. And by the way, just this last week, uh, Representative Valerie Gatos from uh, the Swickley area, uh, who's uh, really come uh, into her own on this issue, posted her own poll on social media and got exactly the same numbers. There was actually also a statewide poll, a uh, non-scientific poll uh, by Politics PA that, that came out with the same results. So that give us, gives us confidence that these numbers are good. And this is an important point. There's no particular slant or bias to voters that would be free to come to the polls. Nationally, what we, what we see is they, they will break one way or the other depending on the candidates, uh, the, the issues, the uh, nature of the, of the particular election. So um, to my mind, it, it goes back to just square one. By bringing those folks to the polls, we're increasing the competition and we're broadening the base of the electorate, which, as I suggested, can only be helpful to the way we govern. It's also very, very popular among just about every media property. You can't call them newspapers anymore, but media properties across the state. So Erie, Westchester, Pittsburgh, Reading, Allentown, Harrisburg, Williamsport, wherever you go. And interestingly, I think part of this has to do with the culture of journalism, which is in a lot of situations they register as independents because they don't want to get hit by the partisan, uh, in, get in the partisan crosshairs. But then sadly, and I think tragically, that means they're taking themselves out of the ability to cast a vote. And I just think that's, that's too uh, high a price to pay. This is just my off the top of my head informal list of other what I'll call experienced supporters. Most of these folks are former elected officials. Jim Roddy right here uh, is prime among them. And you know, people don't give proper credit to former uh, 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 elected officials, which I, why don't I call them experienced because they've been through this. They've seen it. They've seen what it was and what it is and are trying to figure out ways uh, to make it better. There's a, a good cross section of here, I won't go through all these names, but these folks are really, again, I'll, if I had to characterize them, I said these are from the governing wings of the parties. These are the folks where that ratio of service to ambition is reversed from what a lot of what we see today. Now, this is all well and good, but anybody who knows Harrisburg says you need a bill and you need you know, uh, 26 votes in the Senate and 102 votes in the House, and you need a governor's signature. So where are we? Let me just point out, this: there have been bills introduced in at least the last three, maybe even four legislative sessions. So my version of that is the tide's been coming in, and it comes in a little further each time and if things break, it might just come in all the way uh, this year in 2024. 
So let me just give you the, the play by play. In the Senate, uh, the prime sponsors are Dan Laughlin from Erie and Le uh, Lisa Boscola, Democrat from Northumberland County. About 16 co-sponsors and the senators are gonna uh, announce uh, and introduce this legislation April 26th. In the House, you all probably know that the House took a little more time getting themselves organized this year. So uh, they're uh, maybe playing catch up. Uh, but interestingly, there are at least two bills one from a Republican and one uh, with initially from Democratic co-sponsors that are circulating. Uh, in the, on the Democratic side, Jared Solomon, who's been strong on this, and Chris Rabb from Philadelphia. On the Republican side, and I actually just met with her this morning, a brand new Republican legislator named Marla Brown from Newcastle, who uh, is very energetic, comes from a business background, and she's bound and determined uh, to get this done, and we, we welcome that. Importantly, we're not blazing a trail through a thick forest. This has been done before. And uh, in 2019, uh, then President Pro Tem of the Senate, Joe Scarnati, championed an effort to pass a bill through the Senate 42A. So it wasn't close. It was obviously it had to be significant uh, bipartisan uh, support to get that done. So in some ways, we're trying to pick up the trail uh, and, and get through it again. What's the plan? Well, a number of you have been involved in, in efforts, initiatives, campaigns. There's kind of a simple, but uh, the, the simple formula involves a lot of hard work. <laughs> but it's a combination of what folks say is the inside game and the outside game. You've got to work with legislators, incumbent legislators, uh, to bring them around on this issue. We have retained uh, two lobbying firms. One is uh, Allegheny Strategy Partners, led by former President Pro Tem, Joe Scarnati, uh, and also a firm called uh, Triad Strategies, which is a, a veteran firm, uh, which is a longstanding uh, firm uh, based in, in Harrisburg. And they've been work as, working with us for uh, a couple of months to, to get this done. The outside game, uh, we're working with a firm that uh, I think some of you know, at least their principal, which is Denny Civic Solutions and John Denny, who's done a lot of work in the Pittsburgh area. And they're concentrating on what we call the earned media and the social media and kind of building awareness uh, around this. Um, we'll be continuing to build our strength among uh, business, uh, labor, and veterans groups. And we want to obviously take advantage of the run-up to the May 16th primary to get people focused on this issue. We are in the season right now. And special, special added extra bonus uh, insight that I shared, shared with Dave Aaronworth. This requires you to have a maybe a somewhat in the weeds understanding of local politics. This year round, we're electing uh, local judges and local school boards. Um, you may know, if you're uh, really watching the process, candidates for those races can cross file meaning you can file on both the Democratic and the Republican ballot, which seems to suggest that these are not political races. We should be choosing the best person for the job. Except, remember, we're cutting out 1.1 million independent voters who have made it very clear that they are, in fact, uh, playing this from a nonpartisan or an independent. So that's a, that's a further indignity that we're trying to, to bring out uh, in the next couple of weeks. We're building a, a grassroots uh, supporters uh, all across the Commonwealth, not just independent voters, but, but as we say, allies, people who are hardcore Democrats, Republicans, liberals, conservatives, who, who share our concern about the state of politics and figure that this is one way that we can, we can push back. So I really do believe, I'm not making this up, that 2024 could be the year uh, that the, uh, the tide comes in. One thing that a lot of people don't recognize is how many new state legislators we have. About 50, about 50 uh, between the House and the Senate. And someone pointed out, you know, when you get um, first elected, it doesn't take long before you start worrying about your reelection. And here's where I'll go to a little bit of the political logic. The verb to primary is a threat. It's a threat. If I say to you, I'm going to primary you, that is a threat. And then you say, back to what I said earlier, 
Where does that primary threat come from? Bonus points and a, you know, a free spin in the Volkswagen for somebody who could point out to me someone who was primaried from the center. Doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. So, point is, there are a lot of incumbent legislators who are going to be thinking about how they get reelected, and the idea of broadening the base of the electorate with independent voters just might appeal to them. So, again, that's the purely political logic that we're, uh, that we're counting on. Also point out that in general elections, and this was very true in the statewide elections uh, for governor and senator, uh, this past year, independent voters swing the votes. Independent sw voters swing the votes, uh, swing the elections. Josh Shapiro won two to one among independents. Now that was a, not a close race, but then I'll go back to the last two presidential races. In 2016, in Pennsylvania, Donald Trump won independent voters by 7%. In 2020, Joe Biden won independent voters by 8%. So there was a 15-point swing that decided that election. So this is something, and, and the logic here is that if you embrace the idea of welcoming independence into the primary, you are giving yourself a leg up on increasing their turnout, your, their enthusiasm for your party or your candidate in the general. So this is a, a card we're very much, we very much want to play. What can you do? Uh, simply, uh, we'd love you, if you, if you buy my argument, uh, to join the, the community that we've created around Ballot PA, the ubiquitous but still effective call right visit your state legislators. I have a personal preference for handwritten notes to state legislators. Uh, I just wrote one today. Um, it still works. And then, Simple organizing, if, if you are feeling the spirit and are with us on this issue, reach out to a couple more friends to bring them into the fold. Um, I would not be doing my duty if I didn't say you could also contribute financially to support our efforts. We're about two thirds of the way towards the goal that we established uh, for ourselves. And otherwise, be active, be aware, be on point, use your voice. I just want to close with a, a little historical reflection. Uh, and this is the title of an op-ed piece that I came, around, came across last October, um, actually October 21, uh, that caught my eye because it's got a great, it's got a great uh, headline. What we did the last time we broke America. And I read the article and then being my father's son, I looked up the author and it turns out he's written a book called The Age of Acrimony, which is about the state of politics in this country between 1865 and 2015. And we forget this, but politics in the 1860s, 70 post-Reconstruction were an absolute mess. They were a violent mess. Literally, elections were determined by roving bands of torch-wielding voters who, like like urban gangs pursued each other and engaged in violent uh, 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 conflict, either to keep the other team's voters away from the polls or drag them to the polls, one way or the other. So this was like, if you've ever seen that, the Gangs of New York movie uh, that came out a few years ago, that's what it was like. It was loud, it was noisy, it was violent, it was threatening. But here's, here's the punchline. What happened in the late 1800s, 1880s and 890s, is a group of people stepped forward. And this, by the way, is, is when the Committee of 70 was formed, who said, this is not working for us. This is not working. We've got to do something about it. We've got to quiet politics down. We've got to calm things down. We've got to ask more of individual citizens. We can't afford mob rule. So they made a few changes to the process that we take for granted now, but had a huge impact on the way candidates were recruited, candidates ran, elections were carried out. And I just read this in the book the other day. The single most important thing that they accomplished back then was to make the ballot private because 
Heretofore, the parties would literally hand out ballots to people, and then you put them in a box. The advantage from the party standpoint is when they traded you a shot for a vote or a job for a few votes, they could see that you delivered. It was a very public exercise. Once it enters the ballot box and you pull the curtain, it's very private. And so it made it virtually impossible for the political machines to get the kind of traction that they'd had before. And lo and behold, politics quieted down. There were other things, the 19th Amendment that secured the right of women to vote, the independent uh, election of, of senators. Interestingly enough, primary elections were uh, another innovation that, that, that came along at that time. But the point is, again, in, in the grand scope of the American experiment, there was a time when politics had run away from us and had, was causing a lot of problem, and we fixed it. And, you know, fixes don't last forever. But here we are, 125 years later, we have another set of issues, and I would suggest that we have the opportunity to, to fix it, and this is one thing that we can do that will push us back uh, in the right direction. So let me end there. I, I hope I uh, at least intrigued you, if not persuaded you, uh, and I would uh, be glad to. Uh, we've got a couple minutes for questions if anybody has them, but I really appreciate your being here, and uh, fire away. Yep. Thank you. Microphone. Oh, thank you for such a compelling argument that you've presented, and thank you even more for the work you're doing to bring this to the fore. I'm you know, so convinced by this. I'm wondering uh, why these ballots haven't passed before, these measures. What is the argument that is being used against yeah. an open This is primary? the question I get often, and it's the single toughest question to answer, because I'm with you. <laughs> Jim Roddy says this, and he's, you know, had to face uh, voters. I think it, it stems from the fact that, I mean, broadly, people don't like change. They think that the way we vote was handed down on stone tablets by Moses years ago, and that's just the way it is. But maybe more particularly, we're asking incumbent legislators who got elected to tinker with the rules by which they get elected, and that makes them nervous. Uh, it's, a, it's a cautious environment that they operate in. Some would say paranoid. Um, but I think that's, that's where it stems from, uh, just a, a change to the existing order. I, I remind folks, by the way, though, the way we got in this situation is we passed a law in 1937 that took that right away from independent voters. Up to that point, they could have voted in this primary. So... Again, it's just reinforcing a sense it's not a, it's not a, this wasn't on the stone tablets. Uh, a law, you know, taketh away and a law can, can restore that. But that's, that's the, the best answer I can give you. I mean, there's, there's other things that people say. Jim, looks like you want to add on. To, you got something to add that? You're a separate question. Grab the mic. I just wanted to uh, tell you what, I think the big problem will be. First of all, if we did a survey in Pennsylvania uh, about why people live here, uh, I think the majority would say so that when the world comes to an end, we'll have 10 more years. <laughs> uh, they, Pennsylvanians don't like change. But more importantly, uh, the, the committees, the political committees, the Democrats and the Republicans, if you've been to a committee meeting, uh, you learn that the people that that go to these committees, they're, they're seeped in politics. Yeah. That's all they think about. And this is the one thing that sets them apart. They, they, are, they are choosing the candidates. Yeah. And they see this, or they may see this, as a threat that they will lose some of their power. Yeah. If the if the independents vote, so that I think that we've got to overcome that yeah. because having been in office, having right. had to govern, you cannot govern from the extremes of either the left or the right. 
Yep. You have to govern from yep. the middle. Yep. If you're doing your, your job right, you're not elected to represent all Republicans or all Democrats. Yep. You're elected to represent everyone. Yeah. And so I think that if if we can get that message across to the committees so they don't feel threatened, and it gives the committees a rich group of people then to recruit and to join the Republican Party uh, if they've signed up to vote in the primary or the Democrat Party and that. And, uh, and so we really need to give them reasons why yeah. they should not oppose yeah. this. It's a great, great point. I'll just say uh, T.J. Rooney is a former Democratic Party chair who's also a spokesman for us. And he says... If we can succeed, what we've created for the parties is kind of a try-before-you-buy situation, where rather than conscript you into the party in order to let you vote, you can vote, and then you have the chance to engage with the party, learn about their values, history, candidates, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So part of my response, people say, well, if you did this, wouldn't everyone become an independent? I have several answers to that. One is to say, Okay. Second is, though, it really depends on how the parties react to this. If they see this as an opportunity, and I really believe there's an opportunity here, um, then uh, it's not a foregone conclusion. But anyway, great, great point, and thanks for your leadership on this, Jim. Question. Hi. Thank you for this. This was great, um, and I've learned a lot. Um, but I have a question. If I understood you correctly, 80% of the states already have open primaries. Yeah. And I'm wondering, is adding well, Pennsylvania to that really going to be enough to t tip our national politics from crazy and dangerous? <laughs> we are the Keystone State. Just to, just to correct that, uh, there's so many different ways of voting out there, and I'm learning about them all the time, so it's, it's a little, um, it's not quite accurate to say 41 other states have open primaries. They just have different ways of voting that allow independent voters to vote. Um, you know, mostly we're focused on Pennsylvania. Can we improve the climate for governing, the incentives for governing in Pennsylvania? And I'm firmly convinced that this will push us in the right direction. Will this get us all the way there? No. We're, there's lots of other things that are, that are uh, afflicting our political process. But you got to focus on the things that you can do. And I think this is that sweet spot of something that is worth doing and that it's doable. That's why I got into this, because I'm not interested in chasing rainbows. I really believe this is something that we can do and something that will make a difference. Looks like a question from the student contingent, if I have this. If I'm reading the room right. Yeah, this is the kids' table. Um, okay. Hey, so other states have succeeded in repealing closed primaries. And uh, do you know, like, what they did that helped them succeed and how we can emulate that process? Good question. Um, actually, uh, the, there are two examples that within the last 10 years have done what we're trying to do. One is Maine and one is Colorado. Um, they're basically running the same kind of playbook that we are. You've got to make this issue visible, meaningful, bring it to uh, people and voters across the Commonwealth, and you got to work the legislative process. You, you need people like Dan Laughlin, and I mentioned Marla Brown, to, to carry the torch because uh, that's where, uh, you know, the sausage is made. So, uh, and you need to raise money. I mean, all of the things that, that you need to do in a campaign. I have to say, and, and you may know if you're paying attention to this, some states are taking, going much further than, than, than Pennsylvania, than we're proposing for Pennsylvania. Alaska's now got a system where they've got a nonpartisan primary uh, that produces uh, four candidates that then go on to a general election and use what's called ranked choice voting in that general. So there's a lot of experimentation and, and uh, innovation out there. Most of that is happening in states that have initiative processes where if you get a certain number of signatures, you can change a law or a constitution. Pennsylvania doesn't have that. So the only path we have is to go through the legislature, which is why all this. Does that, does that help? Cool. Looks like we have maybe a time for one more if there is one.
Yep, yeah, right here. Uh, what role uh, could third parties have in this process? That's a good question. I see you're wearing your forward party t-shirt. Um, and uh, I think that's a positive development. I, I, I think productive in that competition's good. Uh, but frankly, you know, we're, we're sort of trying to stay in our lane uh, relative to this proposal, which is focusing on independent voters, not, not third parties. But uh, again, I mean, there's, um, there are lots of countries around the world that, that do well with multiple parties. And if you think the competition for voters are good and we're in trouble if we don't think that, then I think we ought to welcome those kinds of efforts. Thank you all. Thanks for your attention. Hope you're with us.